A couple of interesting things concerning that, and, and I'm glad you asked that question. Um, the Bible tells, tells us several things about Joseph in Egypt and some of the things that happened to him. Библия нам рассказывает несколько фактов относительно Иосифа и его пребывания в Египте и того, что с ним происходило. I believe that that canal was probably actually ordered by Joseph as second in command to Egypt. Я думаю, что вот то, что вы прорыли этот канал, это была идея и приказание Иосифа, потому что он по значимости был второй в Египте. The Bible doesn't really say anything about this canal or this man-made lake that was there. But it's obvious whatever Joseph needed to do in order to make sure that there was an abundance of grain that was produced, then he ordered that to be done. When you do look into the scripture concerning uh, concerning what was instructed by the Pharaoh, he basically said that Joseph would be in second command and everything that Joseph said would be done at basically with the family of Pharaoh. Он фактически говорит, что вот все, что нужно Иосифу делать, пусть делает, и фараон как бы подтвердит это или поставит свою печать. Uh, another thing that's just fascinating to me Для меня еще один удивительный момент есть. Is that Joseph um, married while he was in Egypt. He married the daughter of the priest of On. That uh, the temple to On was very near that lake. And it was probably during the time that Joseph was having the lake designed and the canal designed that he met his future wife. Uh, in Yeah, what the? No, I don't know that. Well, there was an obelisk. Yeah, that was in Hierapolis, uh, and I showed that, but it really doesn't show the priest of Almond. Okay, but anyway, it, in in the scripture it says, before the years of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of Almond. И вот а, мы в Библии читаем, что до начала а, голода у Иосифа рождается два сына от, от э, и осенев, э, там, получается, дочки жреца и гелиопольца. So, I think it was probably at that location where he actually met Asenath, and uh, the Pharaoh gave her to him as his wife. И вот, скорее всего, вот в той местности он познакомился с Осенефой, и фараон отдает ему его... And it was through her, of course, that his first son, his sons were born. And their their names are pretty significant, of course. Uh, one, the first one was Manasseh. And the name Manasseh means God has made me forget my trouble and my father's household. And uh, so, by when this son is born, it's like, okay, now I, I can forget all my troubles. I've got a son, and he, he's precious. So, 
And when the second son is born, he names him Ephraim. Which God, which means God made me fruitful in the land of suffering. Very often in the Bible, of course, names, you know, tell us a lot. Очень часто в Библии имена нам очень много чего рассказывают. Case, И вот в этом случае мы видим, что Иосиф говорит о себе что-то. То есть его сердце было долгое время разбито. Но теперь уже как Человек женат, у которого появляются дети, он чувствует, что Господь исцеляет его рану. But anyway, I believe that Joseph was really the one who was involved in actually making Но, those plans and making sure that e Egypt was going to survive this family. Что касается вашего вопроса, то я думаю, как раз Иосиф занимался тем, что подготавливал этот канал и вот делал все необходимое, чтобы Египет пережил годы голода. I mean, Pharaoh made it clear. You know, whatever this guy tells you, you do it. So. All right, now just one other thing before we move into the next part of the uh, of the lesson. This is a stone, what they call a steel, a stila. And it's called the Merneptah steel. And what it does is it shows that by the 18th dynasty, because this was <coughs> evidently written in the 18th dynasty. Там говорится, что 18-й династии, и потому что это стела, скорее всего, датируется 18-й династии фараона. It mentions Israel and evidently is recognizing Israel as a state, a country now. So it proves that Israel was recognized as a nation by Ramesses the second time, and so the 18th dynasty could not have been the <laughs> dynasty of the Exodus. То есть э, еще как бы что мы узнаем, что так как Рамзес II на своей стеле 18-й династии признает Израиль как отдельное государство, то никаким образом они не могли еще быть рабами в Египте. То есть они уже к тому моменту были отдельным государством. Because by the time, I mean, when, when Moses took the people out of the land of Egypt and took them across the Red Sea, and then they went in and conquered the land, they were not recognized then as a nation. Потому что когда Моисей выводит Израиль из Египта, когда вот, они переходят Черное море, когда они начинают захватывать территорию, на которой они будут жить, они все еще не были признаны как отдельное государство. But by the 18th dynasty, they were recognized Но as a nation. Но в 18-й династии они уже становятся отдельным государством. So, anyway, that's the main thing. This particular steel is in the museum in Cairo. И вот uh, то, что я хотела сказать, Эта стела, если вдруг захотите увидеть, она находится в Каирском музее. And it also states and, and shows that, that Egypt at that time did recognize uh, Israel. И вот, опять же, мы должны напомнить, что она значима потому, что в, на этой стеле Египет признает Израиль как государство. Now, I want to continue on. And I want to talk about uh, some some things that have really helped us in learning about Egyptian history and the life in Egypt. For a long time, they could not or did not understand how to read hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics, of course, is the picture language that was used for so many years in Egypt. And during the Napoleonic Wars, this stone was found 
In a place in Egypt called Rosetta. And it became known as the Rosetta Stone. It's a very significant stone because it opened up how to understand hieroglyphics. The top part of the stone, of course, had been broken off. But the stone was divided into three sections. The top part of it was in hieroglyphics. The second part of the stone was in the Egyptian language. A more modern Egyptian. And the bottom was in, I believe it was Greek. Uh, I'll pass this around. This is just a little souvenir that Mary Lee bought me when we were in the British Museum. A little small replica of the Rosetta Stone. So, of course, when they first discovered this, they had no idea what this part was saying in the hieroglyphics. But they could read this one and this one, and it was the same story told in two different languages. And so scholars thought that probably what happened was that this stone was written in the three different languages and was the same story. And sure enough, as they began to get down to this part, which was actually you know, stated down in these lower parts. It began to make sense. And it gave them the keys to understanding hieroglyphics. So now then hieroglyphics can be read and understood. There's a basic at least comparison in, in English to hieroglyphics <laughs> as far as the letters are concerned. And I, I don't have a copy of it, but I'm sure there probably is a copy of some, somewhere where they've done a similar comparison to the Russian language. <laughs> If some of you want to look at it, here's a, uh, a book kind of ba on basic uh, ancient Egyptian. And I'll let you look at that maybe in the break. But you see, the Egyptians used this language and they would use it extensively in their writings and telling about historical events. Also, the Egyptian pharaohs always had what we call a cartouche. Most of them had two, a double cartouche. That would describe their name and position, that kind of stuff. This is the cartouche of Tutankhamun. And that became very significant to them. Now, here's another cartouche. You know what that says? <laughs> J. Don. It says J. Don. <laughs> in hieroglyphics. While we were in Egypt, I also 
got a small cartouche. И вот когда мы были в Египте, я еще и маленький картуш такой приобрел. I'll pass those around. Those Можете you see. You know, those as well. Why why did they have double cartouches? Well, the pharaohs had double cartouches. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. well, like mm -hmm. But they it would describe the pharaoh and, что, вот, and give his name. Yes. Yes. If there was a woman, she would only have one cartouche, right? Mm -hmm. It was really according to her status, evidently, because she was a pharaoh. That if she was a pharaoh, the the one that I showed you the other day, she only had one, I think. But I don't really know everything about the cartouches as far as how many people had what. But. And here's another little fun thing that I found and bought in Egypt. It's uh, a little thing so that you can. You can write your own name in. <laughs> so, now, actually, I would pass that around to you if you want to look at it. So, did you have to water this? Yes, I ordered it done yeah. while I was in Egypt, uh -huh. as well as the small But because that was opened up by the Rosetta Stone, it, it's fascinating when you go to Egypt to, to be with people who can read it. And uh, <coughs> I would have no clue how to read. <laughs> now let me share with you another piece of information that's uh, interesting. Thing. Oh, that's my favorite. About procedures. Вот еще поделюсь с вами очень интересным, прям ну вот очень интересным папирусом, интересной находкой. There have been a number of papyruses that have been found that have described some of the medical practices of the Egyptians. Было найдено множество различных папирусов, которые описывали медицинские практики в Египте. Now, you know the Bible itself uh, in the Old Testament. Moses writes down a number of things that are very practical things about medical practices among the Hebrews. And of course he was trained under Pharaoh. <laughs> Probably was given a very good education. As one of the, at least the adopted sons of Pharaoh. But in his writings, none of these weird things that are found in a lot of the medical practices of the Egyptians ended up being in the writings of the Bible. Но вот э, также интересно отметить, что ничего из египетских э, практик медицинских не попало в Библию. То есть Моисей не записал и в Библии. Let me share with you some of the practices that were done in this Но вот сейчас medical book. Все, кто страдает из заболеваний, пишите рецепты. I just said that you can write down the recipes if you suffer from something. Yes, yes. If you suffer from something, this would be really helpful to you. Это очень полезные рецепты, поэтому как бы древние испытанные временем записывать. And this reveals some of the common medical practices of about 1552 BC in Egypt. <coughs> so, to prevent hair from turning gray, mm, this would be really good. Anoint it with the blood of a black calf, which has been boiled in oil, 
сцедить кровь и потом про проварить ее в масле. And with the fat of a rattlesnake. И также находите гремучую змею. И вот если найдете у нее жир, бросайте туда же. So, uh, any of you that would like to try that, go right ahead. Вот, если хотите попробовать, всегда пожалуйста. Now, some of us, like me, you know, need something to help keep our hair from falling out. Некоторые из нас, вот как я, ну, как бы лысеем, поэтому нужно предотвращать вот этот процесс. Well, their recommend, uh, recommendation for this was to do a mixture of six fats. No, <laughs> Namely, the fat of a horse, <laughs> a hippopotamus, <laughs> a crocodile, <laughs> a cat, <laughs> and a snake, <laughs> and the ibex. <laughs> So, mix well, those six fats together. Why? Oh, <laughs> they want to know this one, huh? <laughs> All right. Okay. The fat of a horse, hippopotamus, <laughs> crocodile, <laughs> cat, <laughs> snake, <laughs> and the ibex. <laughs> By the way, you won't have to memorize these for the test. <laughs> okay. To remove an embedded splinter. <laughs> if you've got a splinter, put on that splinter worm's blood <laughs> and donkey dung. И помета масла. С этим посложнее будет, да? Каждый звучит так, как будто бы. Прям очень хочется. Вот что интересно, что даже в то время существовал такое заболевание, как рак. У людей тоже были опухоли. Но, согласно их верам, a tumor was against the god Zenus. No, согласно тому, что верили они, то как бы опухоль развивалась, когда ты шел против воли бога Зенос. And so their recommendation medically was to do nothing. И вот медицинская рекомендация ничего не делать. Because it would be against their god. Потому что бог еще сильнее разозлится. Uh, they had some interesting things about clothing. Uh, for example, if you want to protect your clothing from mice and rats. Тоже интересный совет. Вот если вы хотите защитить вашу одежду от мышей и крыс, you should apply cat's fat. Нужно эту одежду смочить. Your clothes. В жире кота. Oh, that's what you thought all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that might do the trick, but boy, you probably would really smell bad and look bad. <laughs> so what if I only have like rattlesnake fat? Would that work? I don't think that would work. It has to be cat fat, evidently. <laughs> I don't know. But then you have also one that I thought was very interesting. And it was called a delightful remedy against death. And you take a half of an onion and a froth of beer. <laughs> uh, now, it, it might make you delightful. I'm not sure it would prevent death, but... But, and, and you know, there's a, I'm sure there's a lot more in this virus that are very strange and interesting. But those are just a few. 
Вот But here's the real point of it. <laughs> that even though Moses was reared in the house of Pharaoh and educated like any king's son, not one of the strange medical practices of the Egyptians ended up in the writings of Moses. I believe that his information came from a higher source. And the Bible says it came from God. Now I want to turn our attention to uh, to a further part in the life of Moses. Moses was raised in Egypt as a young man, but he ended up having to flee. He fled to the land of Midian. And he lived there for 40 years. And it was while he was there that he married and he had children. He lived in the uh, lived in the same town as a uh, a man by the name of Jethro, who was one of the priests of Midian. And he then <laughs> ended up spending time. Uh, Till he came to a point in his life where God revealed himself to him in the burning bush. He later goes back into Egypt. He brings the people out of Egypt. And he comes eventually to Mount Sinai where he receives the Ten Commandments. Where is Mount Sinai? All right. Let me just go to this map for a second. Typically, in most of the literature that you will find, the claim is that Israel came out of Egypt and they ended up going to this spot down in here, which is generally kind of, kind of has been counted as the Mount of Sinai. In the Sinai Peninsula. Now, what we're going to do for a few moments is we're going to challenge that. This particular location of Sinai that was that was there, there was a priest who said he had a vision. Вот uh, это расположение горы Синай было выбрано вследствие видения одного из священников, но он сказал, что у него было видение. And that in the vision that God had revealed to him that this was the location of Mount Sinai. В видении Господь открыл ему, что вот здесь располагается гора Синай. So that's essentially the proof that you have for that being Mount Sinai. То есть вот фактически вот вам доказательство того, что вот эта гора Синай это и есть та самая гора. It's totally lacking a lot of evidence. When Israel came out of Egypt, they came out with over a million people. At this location, there's not a place where over a million people could camp. They've never found any Israeli artifacts here. Mm -hmm. 
Even though they would have been camped for quite a while and there would have been trash locations, broken pottery, other things. Plus you also have some problems with where they would have crossed the Red Sea. Плюс вопрос возникает в том, где же они переходят Черное море. This up in here, there's a little place called the Sea of Reeds. Вот здесь находится небольшое перешение, которое называется море Рид. Some people have said, oh, that's where they crossed the Red Sea. И многие люди говорят, что ну вот здесь они и перешли. Well, the Sea of Reeds is only a marsh. It's only about six inches deep. Но вот почему говорят? Потому что вот это море Рид, оно по глубине буквально там меньше метра. And of course, you know, you think, okay, well, what would be the argument against that? Maybe you know it was just a small area, and and God just caused them to go across there. Ну и вот люди, как бы обосновывая свою теорию, говорят, что ну это небольшая местность, не глубокая, не глубокая вода. То есть, скорее всего, Бог их перевел там. And some scholars have come along and said, yeah, there's no real miracle that happened there. И вот, ну, естественно, находятся ученые, которые говорят, ну, не было в этом никакого чуда, что там перейти метр воды. There was one teacher in school one time that was saying this to her children in class. И вот была одна учительница в библейской школе, которая пыталась вот эту идею навязать детям. And she says, eh, that was no miracle, that was nothing. And the little boy at the back of the class hollered, praise God for the miracle. And the teacher, what do you mean, praise God for the miracle? That was no miracle. He said again, praise God for the miracle. She says, why are you saying praise God for the miracle? The little boy said, well, God drowned the whole Egyptian army in six inches of water. <laughs> so, anyway, there's a lot of questions about this. Um, if, you, if you'll even look on ancient maps, they do not describe this as Midian. Если рассмотреть древние карты, то это место не называется Мадиан. Мадиан находится вот здесь. Even on this map, they'll show it Midian here. Вот даже на этой карте мы видим, что Мадиан находится huh. вот с этой стороны. So Moses went to Midian. То есть Моисей пошел в Мадиан. Вот сюда. Hmm. Not so sure about that. Could he have possibly gone over here? Не уверен. А может быть он пошел сюда? Well. <coughs> One of the reasons why we question it is because the Apostle Paul himself said in Galatians chapter 4 verse 25 that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. So maybe we should look at a different location. Так, может быть, стоит рассмотреть другое место. This is not Arabia. Это не Аравия. This for a long time, including during the time of Moses, has belonged to Egypt. Долгое время эта территория, включая во времена Моисея, она прилегала к Египту. Egypt mined copper and all kinds of minerals from out of this area. Здесь египтяне выкапывали меди, разные минералы. So you have no significant place that we know of that they could have crossed the Red Sea at that point. And they needed to cross the Red Sea in order to come to Mount Sinai. If this was Mount Sinai, they could have easily come across on land and down this way. There was no need to cross the water. So, perhaps there's some other possibilities. Here's a newer map that has been done that indicates that there are other possibilities of being Mount Sinai. Но вот еще одна более современная карта, которая 
предполагает, что есть возможность существования другой горы Синай. This is the typical one that has been вот believed Mount Sinai for many years. Это общепринятое мнение относительно того, что вот здесь находится гора Синай. Here's another alternate location вот over here called Jabal El Laws. Еще одна местность, еще одна гора, которая называется Jabal El Laws. That many archaeologists now are believing was the real Mount Sinai. Который, как верят многие археологи, действительно было вот той самой горой Синай, о которой мы говорим. And I would suggest there's a lot of proof for that. И я бы даже сказала, что доказательств в пользу этой горы больше. Josephus said that Sinai was the highest of the mountains near the city of Median. Иосиф Лави говорит о том, что это была наивысшая из гор неподалеку от, от Мадиана. This is one of the ancient maps that has medium shown. Вот одна из древних карт, где отмечается Мадиан. And this would be the Gulf of Aqaba here. А это вот залив Акаба. And it's over in Arabia. И он находится в Аравии. So there have been a number of people that have been saying, let's look then in Arabia if we possibly can. One of the difficulties of going into Arabia is that the, the people of Arabia do not allow you to go in freely, especially as a Christian or a Jew. Одна из проблем исследования аравийской территории в том, что правительство этой местности не разрешает просто свободно приходить и смотреть, особенно если ты христианин или еврей. But I want to first of all talk about where it might have been possible and probably was the location of where they crossed the Red Sea. Но сначала давайте поговорим о возможности, возможном месте, где Люди могли перейти в Черное море. They may have left Egypt from this location, came on across, Они могли выйти из Египта здесь, and crossed the Red Sea here. Потом перейти вот этот полуостров и перейти Черное море в этом месте. Now, the reason that I say that that may be possible is because there is some evidence for that. И почему я говорю, что это возможно? Потому что есть определенные свидетельства. In that particular part of the Red Sea, в этой части or the Sea of Aqaba, или, uh, which is a part of the Red Sea, вот залива Акаба, что тоже является частью Черного моря, there is a natural land bridge at this particular point. Есть природный перешейк на вот как раз в этом месте. It goes down about uh, 90 feet under the water at the lowest part. Uh, so it still would have very definitely been a great miracle for God to have parted that water there. And some of the archaeologists have found some pillars like this, one on one side and one on the other side. And according to the uh, pillars, they said these were pillars that were put there by Solomon. To mark the place where the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. So they've been doing a lot of interesting study of those area, this area. One of the things that you find as you go into this area, you find an area of land where a million people could have camped out before the Red Sea. Когда приходишь в эту местность, то там достаточно большая территория суши, где могли бы разместиться миллион человек вот перед тем, как перейти в Черное море. And the name of the place is called Nueva, and it means waters of Moses opening. И uh, даже название этого места историческое это Nueva, то есть это место открытия вот Моисея. Now, if you read the scripture. You describe, they describe the Moses then being chased and Israel being chased by Pharaoh's army. And 
And according to the scripture, there was a pathway there with mountains on either side. They came to this point and they said, we have no place to go. The sea is before us. They couldn't go back through this because Pharaoh and his armies were coming through this. And they were blocked in. So what we have here is a situation where it would fit the biblical narrative. Israel would be here needing to go across into Midian or Arabia. And they would be trapped. They would have no place to go. This is a picture I took from an airplane from the air. Of that same place. And you'll notice that there's a pathway here that the people could come through. Pharaoh and his army could come in behind them. The Bible indicated that God had put something in his way, fire in his way, a pillar of fire. And stalled the army there. And now then, Israel is trapped. Needing to get across here. So, another thing that they not only found, they, I mean needed to find, they needed to see if there was anything under the water that would indicate that there was people or bones or chariots or anything like that that had been trapped under the water. Because the Egyptian army, if they were going in through after them, they would have been with a chari uh, on, with uh, had their chariots, and of course the Bible talks about God making the chariot wheels fall off. This particular chariot is in the Cairo Museum, but it gives an illustration of one of the types of wheels that were used on those. Here's another one. This was another type of chariot wheel that was used. What was amazing, as they went down under the water, <laughs> divers went down. They went down and they discovered things that looked like wheels. Through time, of course, barnacles had gotten onto these wheels. And so it was very hard to see them clearly, but they could tell the basic shape was that of a wheel. They did come across this one, which this was gold. Perhaps that was Pharaoh's chair. Don't know. But barnacles won't grow in gold. So this one could be clearly seen. As they were proceeding further, they found that there were places that looked like that might have been axles <laughs> and a wheel on it. Basically, this is what it would look like, you know. Again, covered with barnacles. 
со временем все-таки они обросли кораллом. They also, as they continued, not only found these kind of things, which would indicate there were chariot wheels under there. They also found human bones and animal bones under there as well. There have been videos that have been made. The guys that have done the dives under there have put together videos, and you could probably find them online. But the Bible says, and the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army, and he made the wheels of the chariots come off. So if this was the location of where they crossed, that would be things that should be found. То есть, если бы, если предположить, что Израиль приходил именно в этом месте, то фактически логично было бы найти как раз то, что было найдено. И вот эти вещи были найдены. So I personally believe that this is the location of where Israel crossed the Red Sea. Лично я верю, что как раз это вот тот перешейк, по которому еврейский народ перешел в Черное море. Then they would have come to the land of Gideon. Ну, переходя, они бы попали в землю Midian, in Arabia, which Paul says. And there are a number of locations that are described in the Bible that correspond with the things that have been found in this land of Midian. One of the places was a place called Elam. It was a place of 12 springs. It also had a lot of palm trees. And this place is, has been located. Here's another map. Where you would have Noeba over here, where they would come across. Then they would come down this area. One of the places they would have come to was a place called Albad. Они бы подошли к месту под названием Албат, which traditionally there has been identified as the home of Jethro and Moses. Который считается домом Моисея и Иофара. Here's a picture from Albat. Вот эта фотография из Албата. They don't know exactly which one of these may have been the home of Jethro, but it was evidently in this area. So, it's time for us to have a break, so let's take a break now, and then we'll come back and we'll talk more about Sinai.